football and oppression. That's what Thanksgiving has come to mean to many Americans. Back in 2007, Seattle public school officials made national news by describing the holiday as a time of mourning and a bitter reminder of 500 years of betrayal. This new narrative describes the pilgrims as arrogant oppressors who fled persecution only to become persecutors themselves, depriving Native Americans of their land and their lives. But this is wrong on every count. First of all, the pilgrims didn't cross the ocean to flee persecution or even England. They'd been living for over a decade in Holland, Europe's most tolerant nation and a haven for religious dissenters. Free from interference by the Church of England, they feared seduction, not persecution, worrying that their children would be corrupted by the materialistic Dutch culture. That's why they risked their dangerous 1620 voyage to a wilderness continent, not because they were running from oppression, but because they were running toward holiness, fulfilling a fateful mission to build an ideal Christian commonwealth. They initially planned to plant this model society on the wild, wolf-infested island known to natives as Manhattan. But winds and tides blew them 250 miles off course, dumping the Mayflower on the frozen coast of Massachusetts. Somehow, the pilgrims saw their dire situation as a demonstration of providential power, especially after a giant wave picked up the flimsy boat of a scouting party on a stormy December night. The turbulent sea then deposited them safely, miraculously, on a little island within sight of the ideal location for their settlement. It was a deserted Indian village with cleared land, stored supplies of corn, and a reliable source of fresh water. No, these supposedly cruel conquerors never actually invaded that village. Instead, they expressed a fervent desire to pay the natives for the dried corn they found. If only they could find someone to pay. But the former inhabitants had perished during three years of plague, probably smallpox, that immediately preceded the pilgrim's arrival. One of the few survivors of that devastation turned up several months later to welcome the English newcomers. Against all odds, he proved to be the single human being on the continent best suited to help the struggling settlers, since he spoke English and had already embraced Christianity. His name was Squanto, and he had grown up in this very village before a ruthless sea captain kidnapped him as a boy and sold him into slavery in Spain. After four years, he was freed by kindly monks, then made his way to England, and finally sailed across the Atlantic only to find his friends and family all wiped out by disease. Over the next few months, Squanto helped the English newcomers plant crops and negotiate a friendly trade agreement with the region's most important chief, Massasoit. No wonder pilgrim leader William Bradford called Squanto a special instrument sent of God for their good. The celebration, later known as the First Thanksgiving, actually involved a three-day harvest festival in October, apparently inspired by the biblical holiday of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Ninety hungry Indian warriors joined the 53 surviving pilgrims for this occasion. Nearly half of the colonists had died during the brutal winter. The Englishmen provided some vegetables, fish, and perhaps wild turkeys, while the natives brought five recently hunted deer as house gifts. The preferred sport on this occasion wasn't football, but shooting, with settlers and Indians sharing a fierce fascination with guns. Though these hardy pilgrims loom large in the American imagination, they never built their Plymouth settlement into a major colony. And nearby Boston, the later colony of Massachusetts Bay, grew so much faster that it swallowed up the great-grandchildren of the pilgrims in 1691. But the sense of purpose of the original pilgrims left a permanent imprint on the national character. They maintained unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant special privileges, 
but to impose special responsibilities. They saw themselves as instruments, not authors, of a mysterious master plan. Today, with our continued blessings so obvious and so overwhelming, the only reason to treat this beloved national holiday as a time of mourning is that some foolish Americans actually think that's a good idea. The pilgrims knew better. They understood that people of every culture and every era can gain more from gratitude than from guilt. I'm Michael Medved for Prager University. Um, the pilgrims, something that the pilgrims do um, that they would have in their, in their uh, just religious, they didn't just meet on Sundays and do church. They would actually, so on Sundays they would get together. It was almost like a Jewish, like Jewish uh, tradition. They would read the scripture, they would dance together, and they would do certain traditional things. But during the midweek service, I love this, during the midweek service is where they would eat together and they would do topical studies, which would be like, why does God hate us? 
You know what I mean? So they would do a topical study on that. And that's when they would eat. The way that the Thanksgiving came about is they actually invited the Native Americans to their feast and to their topical study in hopes for what? Do you know who Jesus is? Like, does that make sense? So it was like this thing. They literally invited him to church. And the first Thanksgiving was a church service. Think about that. The first Thanksgiving was a church service. They were just living out Acts 2.42. They got together, they ate together, they prayed together. They, you know what I mean? They did all this stuff together. And then that party just turned into three days. I mean, did you hear how many deer they had? That's a lot of deer. That, that's a lot of food. I'm just saying. Are you guys with me on that one? I just thought it was really neat. Anyways, back to George Washington. So in 1777, he makes it a national holiday. Um, it's on a Tuesday. Congress actually didn't like the day that he picked. And so it kind of just floated um, until the 1800s. In 1863, uh, yeah, 1863, you had another president uh, named Abraham Lincoln. You might know him too. Um, he is the first one that actually got together and said, we are going to make this a national holiday. And he picked the fourth, uh, the fourth Thursday in November and said that's the day that we're going to do it but here's why we're going to do it. Now this is very important. I think this is neat. The reason we're doing this isn't for the pilgrims. It's not for that. See Abraham Lincoln in 1863 was in the middle of what we called the Civil War and everybody, the North, the South, we were all depressed. We had to kill our brothers and our sisters and our nation was getting ripped apart and there was nothing to be celebrated. Are you guys with me on this one? Abraham Lincoln saw Thanksgiving as a day to literally sit back and say, we need to come together at least for a day. Remind ourselves what God has given us. Now, this is important. He actually says, this is actually in it. What God has given us. And remember to thank our creator for everything that we have. So they would literally, they took a break for Thanksgiving. All battles, all wars, they just stopped. And they said, we are going to remember God and what he has given us on this day. Right? Jump forward to 1939. 1939. There was a guy named Franklin D. Roosevelt. Right? FDR. Yeah. Right? Franklin Roosevelt. He comes in and he goes, you know what? I don't like Thursday being the day. We're going to change the date, and we're going to say that it's going to be on November 26th from here on out. We're just not going to say, we're just going to, that's it. It's, it's like Christmas. Wherever Christmas lands, that's just it, right? I'm not joking. The entire nation had an uproar over this. The nation was just like, whatever. Now, if you don't know anything about FDR, he had kind of this pride thing going on. He's like, I'm right. So he, for two years, he fought it. He fought it for two years, and then he admitted his mistake. And to prove that he admitted his mistake, he says, we're not just going to call this a national holiday. We are making it a law in our nation that the fourth Thursday of November, nobody works, and we are giving thanks to God, and we're calling it Thanksgiving. It's a freaking law, y'all. <laughs> it's a law to have Thanksgiving. This is awesome. Like... Like, is it, I, don't, I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but it's a law. And, like, like I just thought that was cool. Um, and today, I, I wanted to share a couple things with you that has to do with Thanksgiving and Esther. Is that cool? Now, some of you are like, how are you going to pull that off? Just stretch with me. All right? No, just kidding. <laughs> now, I want to share this with you. And I, I want to go back to what the video that we just saw. And I want to read just a couple of the quotes that he had. Because I think it is extremely interesting to see a couple of these things. I want us to kind of remember them as we move forward into Esther. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, the first thing is this. They maintained an unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant them special privileges, but to impose special responsibilities. Let it sink in. Here's what I want us to remember of this. They had an unshakable confidence that God was protecting them no matter what. Did that make, are you guys with me on this one? The second thing is, is this, is that he didn't protect them because they had special privileges. That's a good word for this generation right now, right? There's privileges for everything. And here's the thing. 
The pilgrims never saw themselves as having special privileges. They didn't see themselves greater than somebody else. Does this make sense? They didn't walk into Plymouth Rock and, and steal um, from the Native Americans. That's not what they did. You guys heard the story, which is absolutely correct. Now, you're right. The smallpox disease did come from England, and it did come from those people. So, yes, but the, but the pilgrims weren't the ones that came and wiped them out. Did that make sense? They didn't come and think that they were, oh, you're like, well, who did it? Well, all the others. They, the pilgrims weren't the only ones to come over here, okay? Um, so the reality is come, and this, they didn't come over and think they were better than everybody else. What they came over is they said, look, we believe that we can help each other. Did that make sense? Not that we have privileges and we should do this. No, what they were saying is we are just basically in the, in, we have a responsibility to take care of each other. And with the Native Americans, one thing's from William Bradford, if you have anything, listen to the, some of the things that William Bradford talked about, especially with the Mayflower Compact and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, Craig, that's history. I don't like that stuff. Read it. It's good. The word God is in there. Um, he basically tried to create this, this society where it says we love on one another. Now I'm going to be real with you. His society didn't work very well because it was a communist society and those don't work out very well. And that's why, unless you're a communist, you're like, I hate this church. Um, it's proven not to work. Um, <laughs> politically correct, gone. Um, <laughs> So the reality starts to become, from, uh, then the colonies from Massachusetts obviously came down to Plymouth and they overtook them and just kind of swallowed them up and it just became this one big thing. But here's the thing, the ideal stayed the same, that we don't have special privileges, but we have these responsibilities as human beings. Are you guys with me on this one? Okay, the next thing that I think was very interesting that they said is, they saw themselves as instruments, not authors of a mysterious master plan. Same kind of concept. I'm just a tool in the hands of the Almighty God. So many times we have people, especially nowadays, where they're like, no, no, no I'm going to write my own story. I'm going to do this. And we get taught that through, through, through school, to be, to be honest. School says, hey, you got to do this. You got you, you to make your thing. You got to make your plan. You want to make money. You, 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 you. And then all of a sudden we get into this humanism type of a thing. We're like, where's God? And it's like you threw him out a long time ago. What you're trying to do now is when you bring God into humanism, me, 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 all you find yourself doing is using God as an instrument instead of him using you as an instrument. Did that make sense? And so this was an opposite, this, the pilgrims had an opposite way of thinking about that. They were saying, God, we're here, utilize us. It's your master plan, it's your thing, we're just going to keep listening to you and just keep moving forward. Did that make sense? Um, Another thing that was said I just thought was really interesting. They saw their misfortune as a demonstration of providential uh, power. And providential, if you guys don't know, is guidance of God or God doing it. Does that make sense? And so basically they saw all their misfortune as, hey, God's doing something greater than us. Let's just go with it and find out where we land. Did that make sense? The Mayflower couldn't have landed in the worst spot. If you think about this. They were headed to a place that was like, hey, it's going to be warmer in the, in, in the winters. Um, it has lots of places for food. They can hunt. They can do all this stuff. Instead, they landed on what seemed to be a frozen tundra. And they're like, yeah, let's try to live this out. Does this make sense? And the, instead of sitting back saying, oh, man, we stink. Let's just die. They got together and they said, no, God must want us here for a reason. And I love this. Did you know if they landed in, in, in Manhattan, they would have never met Squanto? Squanto would have missed them by hundreds of miles. Does that make sense? The only reason why the pilgrims even survived was because of Squanto. Now, let's just look at Squanto. Because this guy, A, has the coolest name ever. But B, Squanto was taken as a, as a young kid. He was kidnapped by, an, by a pirate, necessarily, okay? And he was taken back to Spain and sold into slavery. Talk about misfortune, right? 
But there in Spain and through the slavery, not only does he get to learn a different language and also learn English, one of the languages that he knew, okay, he also gets basically sold into slavery to a monk. The monk didn't want him as a slave. The monks at that time were buying slaves to set him free. Are you guys following me on this one? So he gets bought by a monk who happens to be a Christian monk and he takes him in and he just says, do you want to know about Jesus? So he teaches him all about the Bible, all about scripture, teaches him who Jesus is, and then he takes him off to England. England sends him back to, the, to, to his homeland. Right there when he comes back home, he sees who? English settlers. He not only speaks the language, but he understands their God. Does that, are you guys with me on this one? The misfortune of Squanto is horrible. But if you actually read some of the things about Squanto, as long as the things that I've read, the, they, they all seem to link up. Squanto did not live a horrible life at the end of his life. He lived his life actually as, as honored. Because the Plymouth honored him, uh, the Pilgrims, excuse me, honored him with everything that he did. And he was the gateway between the Native Americans and, and the English settlement. He literally was like the very first, if you will, like ambassador to help everybody out. And he was Christian at the same time. Matter of fact, they have a quote from Squanto. Uh, I should have brought that. Uh, there's a quote that says uh, from Squanto before he dies. He says, I cannot wait to go meet the God of the Englishman. And I'm so glad that I got to meet him and you. Like, I just think, like, that's, in, that's incredible. Like, Squanto's like the man. Um, sorry. Um, that was a rabbit trail. But I think Squanto is so awesome. And, and I want us to remember this. They saw their misfortune as a demonstration of, of provincial uh, power, which is God's power, divine power. Does that make sense? We have an innate need in, in, in our today's society where we look at something and it's bad and immediately, we think we're outside of God's will. We think we've done something wrong. Or we sit down and go, God hates me. Why follow him? Does that make sense? We have, these are our thought processes. And these were not the thought processes of the pilgrims when they first showed up. Are you guys with me on this one? Now we're going to get into Esther. Now with those thought processes, we have to get into Esther because I really firmly believe that the pilgrims had the same point of view as the Jewish people did during, um, during the... Are you guys with me? Yeah? yeah. yeah. All right, just making sure. Okay. Before we get into Esther, I know last week we had a little bit of a break. We had Frank and, and Pam Grubbs here. We did the whole international, and there was kids that were sponsored and all that kind of stuff. Um, you guys, I just want to just share, I just want to be a big thank you to our church. Um, the love that you poured out to Frank and Pam was absolutely amazing. Um, they just, they had, we, we had 20 kids um, sponsored last week, and we don't have a very big church, so that's like huge. You're like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you guys. Um, it's just amazing. And then, honestly, the 20 lives that are going to be absolutely transitioned and changed. I just, yay. All right, anyways. Um, here's where we go. I want to go, uh, kind of go back over Esther real quick. Remember, this is taking place in Persia, right? Persians, you guys remember all this stuff? The Babylonians, they took over the Babylonians. They did all these things, right? If you don't remember that, you could really read very fast and get all that. Okay, next thing is this. <laughs> Xerxes is the one that comes in, but Xerxes is actually just basically his Greek name or his Persian name. Um, he goes by Asherias. Yep. Um, but just to give you guys a heads up, this is also the same guy that was in, if you ever saw the movie 300, um, this is the, the, the same king, if you guys will. But don't think 300 was historically accurate, okay? Um, this guy did not walk around seven feet tall and think he was a god and like have weird special powers. Okay. Um, and for those of you that are now wondering about 300, you don't have to see it. It's gory. Um, um, and fake abs. I just had to. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, uh, so that's who Xerxes is. Um, he, his dad, obviously, he, he gives him power because he, it's, a, it's a bloodline. Then he had this wife. His wife is Vashti. And Vashti, uh, if you guys remember this, um, she was basically Babylonian royalty. Um, uh, her father was killed. You can find that in, in Daniel. Um, literally, uh, the, the Babylonians were doing horrible, horrific things in the temple and all these type of things. And God literally, with a finger, wrote on the wall what was about to happen. And it freaked everybody out in a candelabra 
Barbara falls on her dad and crushes his skull. Yay, Bible. Um, yeah, it's crazy. You should read the Bible. It's pretty cool. Um, Vashti, there, there, there's recordings that Vashti, uh, there was this commotion within the kingdom and there was a guy sitting on the, in the throne where her dad usually sits, which happens to be the next king, um, which is Xerxes' father. And he actually, and she ran and sat in his lap. He felt pity on her and actually took her and married her into the, the family, which is giving her to his son. Everybody with me on that one? And then we enter into Esther, and Esther opens up with this story of this immaculate party that was going on. That the, the King Xerxes um, was basically just showing off everything that he has, all of his land, all of his stuff. And the party went on, I think, for 180 days. I mean, it was, it was a party party, okay? Now, the thing is, though, is there, there were some hidden agendas within this party. Because even though the king was throwing this party in the garden, he wasn't throwing the party in the palace where it was supposed to be. So his wife, Vashti, decides that she's going to throw the party right. And she puts the party in the palace where it needs to be, but she invites only the women. So the women are having a party, and he's having a party, and there's these two parties going on for 180 days. Everybody with me on this one? Turns out about the 180th day, he gets a little drunk. Guy can hold his liquor. That's all. I don't know. All right. It says that on that day he gets he is completely filled with wine. Uh, he's not in his right mind, and he calls for his queen um, Vashti to come in because he wants to show her off. Does this make sense? But he only wants her to wear her crown. That's it. Just so y'all know, that's that's that was the the thing. I just want her to wear the crown. Okay, um, so um, she goes in and she tries to get out of this. She's like, no, I'm not doing that. Now, if you, you have to hear the message. I'm not going to go over that entire message again. But you have to hear the message of that, which is you think that she's just like, yeah, good for her, women's rights, blah, blah, blah. Actually, it's God doing something. It was God actually showing her up and actually showing her um, what she was doing to the Jewish uh, slaves that she had. And it was this big thing. And if you want to see that message, you can go on our website and... Good plug. All right. That's what's happening there. Got it? Because she wouldn't come visit the king, the king looks over at his, like, his entourage, and he's like, what should we do about this? And one of the guys is like, well, I write laws. Let's just make a law that she can't ever see you again. He's like, yeah, that sounds good. That'll teach her. Here. And that's how it ends. Now we go to chapter 2. Chapter 2 starts up, and he goes like this. Chapter 2 starts up, and he goes, hey, where's my wife? Because he's now in his right mind. You know, the headache is gone. Things are starting to sober out a little bit. And he's like, hey, where's my wife? And he's like, and the guy looks at him and he goes, well, you wrote a law that said she can never see you again. So she's, by the way, this is, there, we don't know what happens to Vashti. There's one of two thoughts. She's just banished from the kingdom or she's dead. The, the, the Talmud and all the Midrashes, which are the Jewish people, they say that she died. They say that they killed her because that would be the only way that she could never see him again. Okay? But there's other things that says, says we don't know what happened to her, but she's just not allowed to see the king anymore. Does that make sense? Either way, the law is irrevocable, which means they, there's nothing that he can do to make this happen. And this makes him sad. He's like, dang it! You're supposed to be my friend. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what the heck were you thinking? Like, you're supposed to help me out. And this is why you're not supposed to drink everybody. Okay. <laughs> everybody with me on this one? Okay. The whole thing that we're supposed to learn from that was this. People have hidden motives, agendas, pride, and arrogance. These are the snares or traps that ruin family gatherings. If you think about what this was, I, I made this joke that it was the worst or best Thanksgiving dinner ever, okay? It was a 180-day party, and at the end of it, everybody's upset at each other, and somebody either ends up dead or is outcasted from the family. <laughs> Sounds like Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> Except there's only one day or a weekend, okay? So here's the thing with that. The thing we said is this, the things that start to get into us is these hidden motives, these agendas. Are you with me on this one? And that's what we talked about, and that's back up to speed. Now what I want to do is, is kind of go into chapter 2. And in chapter 2, I won't bore you to death by reading the entire chapter to you, because I'll be honest with you, it's kind of boring. Okay, but I do want to share a couple things that start to take place. Everybody with me on this one? Yep. First things first, King Xerxes shows up. 
And as he shows up, he wants to know where his wife is. He doesn't know where his wife is. They tell him, this is the decree that you made. He gets mad. A, at himself for letting him do that. B, at his people because they allowed him to do that. And so the people are trying to save their behinds, right? So what do they come up with? I need, what is another thing that we can do? So they come up with this elaborate plan. They said, hey, don't be sad. There's a lot of pretty girls out there. What if we just go through all of Persia, all the provinces, and we just bring in all the cuties? Bring them all in just for you. And then you can pick which one you like the most, and that'll be our new queen. That's how that, they're trying to, do you get with it? That is a dumb plan. Let me explain why it's a dumb plan. If you know anything about history, Marriage was very sacred and it was important. Not because you get to pick your own wife or husband. Does this make sense? You picked a wife or a husband because they were going to get you more honor within the society in which you lived in. Did that make sense? So for these guys to come up with a random plan that just says, pick any girl that's pleasing to your eye and we'll make her queen... This was a horrible idea because what you're doing now is you're taking somebody that might not be of royal descent or might not be of any type of descent at all, might be hor they might have shame on their entire family and now just because they look good, they're now going to be the queen of Persia. Does this make sense? And now you just bring their entire family up. Are, are you with me on this one? This is why this could be a very bad thing, depending on what agreements they have with other countries. Are, are you guys walking with me in this one? So for them to come up with this plan, here's the only way I could think about it. Hey, you know how fast this guy goes through things? Let's just come up with a plan. Let's just throw it at him. We'll throw a bunch of girls at him. And then this will be over in like a, maybe a few months or maybe a year. We'll be good. Is that okay? Let's just throw this at him and then we'll just figure this out later on. Are you guys with me on this one? This is what happens. Problem, he doesn't forget. They have to go through with this plan now. Everybody still tracking? Enter in a new character. Okay? A new character, his name is Mordecai. A, I don't know why we don't call anybody Mordecai anymore. That's, a, that's like a really cool name if you think about it. It's a power name too. Like, can you imagine like your kid's name being Mordecai? Like, you just got to be like, it's a, it's a power name though. It's like, Mordecai, get in here. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, you can't like, if he's on the football team, it's like, who do we send in? Mordecai can do it. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, ugh, it's a power name. Like, anyways, so, so Mord <laughs> Mordecai's a good name, bro. Ah. <laughs> I thought Tartanian was a good name too, but my wife wouldn't let me call him Tartanian. So, uh, with that said, um, Mordecai is right now. Here's the thing Mordecai, if you, if you guys got to remember this, the Babylonians got mad at the Jewish people and they scattered them throughout the region. Okay? This is the great exile. Um, it, it's, it's known as a couple different names, but it's just this exile. They just kicked them out. Okay? Mordecai was kicked out with the king of Judah at the time. Now, because of that statement that's in the scripture, we can, A, we assume things as theologians and we can kind of get something. He might have been somebody within the king's um, uh, court, if you will. Uh, maybe uh, somebody uh, of, uh, not royalty, but somebody of wisdom within the king's court. Did that make sense? And so Mordecai, because this one kind of phrase that's in there connected him to the king of Judah before the, before the exile happens, this is like something that we have. The next thing that we see with Mordecai, it says that he sits at the king's gate. Now, when he says he sits at the king's gate, that does not mean he's a beggar. Because every time you read in the New Testament, what do you read? They were sitting at the gate of beautiful, or he was sitting at the gate of this. And every time we read that, we're thinking that they're, they're beggars or they're poor people. There's something wrong with them, right? 
That's actually not what's, what's going on thousands of years prior. In Persia at the time, the, the way that it worked is you weren't even allowed to get to the king's gate because that was an inner court unless you were part of the king's court. Did that make sense? Somebody that kind of has a little bit of responsibility within that palace. Did that make sense? So what is actually what the historical records reference this He's not the only one sitting at the gate. There's a whole band of people just sitting at the gate. Does that make sense? And they're waiting at any moment of any day the king can say, I need this. And Mordecai has to be ready to jump. Did that make sense? And where do you find Mordecai? At his house? No, right outside. Is everybody tracking with me on that one? So he's not sitting out there being a beggar. He's sitting out there because there's got to be some connection with Mordecai, his job, and what's going on in the kingdom. Is everybody still walking with me? Okay. Next thing that happens, Mordecai has a daughter. Kind of. It's not his daughter. It's actually his cousin. Okay. What happened was, is during the exile, um, his cousin Myrtle, that's right y'all, Myrtle. That. I cannot get any clearer than Myrtle, okay? Now, I, I just, I like that name too, but it's not a power name. That's a weird name, you know? It's Myrtle, I don't know. It has so many. Did anybody else think of a turtle? Yes. You see? Dr. Seuss screwed us up. Um, there's a Myrtle the turtle, right? And Dr. Seuss? Sorry. I'm all jacked up in my head now. All right. So Myrtle, okay? Myrtle, we don't know her exact age, but Myrtle, during the exile, her mother and father had passed away. Therefore, she goes to live um, with her uncle, but now her uncle somehow passes away too, or they all pass away at the same time, and her relative, who happens to be Mordecai, who is her cousin, takes her in as the daughter. Did that make sense? So Mordecai now gets this insta-daughter, okay, and... He's a dad. Now the problem is, here's the problem. There's a decree that goes out within the, the providence, and he is the first one that kind of gets the heads up that they're going to be taking girls. Um, how to put it? They're kidnapping girls to basically go in and sleep with the king. Today's society, we call that sex trafficking. Does that make sense? This is, I want to be real with you guys. I, as much as you, that, that, that sex trafficking, all the rage that you, comes with that, I want you to get this because that's what's happening right now. It's not like, like, like when you read it, it sounds like it's a beauty contest. You're like, come on, Myrtle. Like, you know what I mean? That is not what's happening. There are young women getting taken against their free will and thrown into a palace in hopes that the king likes them enough to be there. Now, here's the next thing you got to know. When they get taken from their home, they are never coming back. Did this make sense? They are never coming back. Because when they got taken, whether they win or not, as soon as they sleep with the king, they either become a second wife or they become part of basically, um, they called it something different, but basically, um, what is it called? Concubines. We'll go with that word. That's way better. Um, the concubines. Okay. This is, does that make sense? So either way, they're not coming back. And, 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 there's, and, and here's, uh, this is irritating. There's only one way. One way. They're getting sold or they're getting taken for sex. Did that make sense? This, that yeah, irritates me. But this is the society they lived in. So when you hear about Myrtle, and you're like, who is Myrtle? Myrtle is actually Esther. See, in order to conceal her name, or in, to, in order to conceal her heritage, they changed her name to Esther. And it's actually not Esther, that's the, the American one, it's Esther. You gotta put like elongated ear part of it, okay? So it makes it sound better. Esther, see? Better, right? Esther means the star. Or it means the god of Venus. And Venus being a star, so either way, it's the star, okay? 
And now that we're going to make this Christmassy, for the rest of the season, we're going to follow a star to salvation. Does that make sense? Because that's what's going to happen in this story. So Myrtle changes her name to Esther, and Esther um, gets taken from Mordecai and uh, to put into this contest. How do you think Mordecai's feeling? His job was to take care of his cousin. Can you imagine, okay, by the way, honor, shame, society, if you think about things in these realms, there's no way he can take care of her anymore. He failed as a father. He failed his family. He failed. Do you understand? This would make you do crazy things. And so what does he do? He's going to do everything he can to uphold the name of his, uh, of his family. And he's going to do everything he can to take care of Esther as much as he possibly can. So he does weird things like he goes by the harem every day. By the way, harem is another word for a house. It's a house where the concubines or the second wives usually stay. It's separated from the palace, but that's where they stay. And it was a mansion anyway, so it was really nice. And they had the privileges of the palace. They just didn't live in the palace. So a harem would be that. Did that make sense? That's also where a lot of the daughters of the king and everybody would stay. It was like this, uh, I hate to say it, but it was like, like, like the Playboy Mansion type of an idea. If you think about it that way, that's what it was like, okay? So this is this immaculate thing. Because, this is cool, because of Mordecai's position, being able to come into the king's gate, he was allowed to go to the, to the, to, to the, uh, to the harem, to the house. Did that make sense? So Mordecai, every day, went to the harem to find out how his daughter was doing. Now, he couldn't talk to her directly, so this is the cool part. He and she made friends with the eunuch that was there taking care of them. Does that make sense? So now you're going to have these two people into this story. And what happens is, and this is funny because you think that it's this long, drawn-out thing. It's really not. It's literally five verses long. Okay? Five verses sum up four years. Okay? Five verses, four years. Okay? What are those verses? Um, Esther was really pretty to look at. Esther found favor among everybody. Esther was really, really pretty. The king likes Esther. The king chooses Esther. That's it. Beauty contest over. Does that make sense? Now, the reason why I say it's a four-year gap is because by the time Queen Vashti was exiled um, or killed, and by the time she becomes queen, it becomes four years. And a year of that was her being prepared to see the king. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? She becomes queen. This is what's going on. She's now in the palace with the king. A, she didn't have to do anything. This is the cool part about Esther. There's a part in there that says that you can bring anything you wanted to go see the king for the first time. Which means you can make yourself look lavish. You can bring him gifts to get him to like you. She does none of that. You know what she said? She said, I'm just going to go. Because why? Because it's either he's going to like me or he's not going to like me. I'm not going to try to persuade him in any way, shape, or form. I'm just going to be me. And that's the one thing that the king, Xerxes, he couldn't, he like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Why? Because you're not like anybody else. Everybody else tried to whine and dine me and try to do all these things. You just were like, this is it. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Now, I say that, but you have to understand this is going to be very important coming up later in the story. Okay? Or in the, in the account. Here's the next thing that happens. Mordecai is just kind of like, okay, good. She's in the palace now. She's not part of the harem anymore. She's not a concubine, which is kind of a better thing in his eyes. I think in all of our eyes, right? So she's actually queen, which means she has some kind of power, but she doesn't have a ton of power, which actually would mean to rise up her family name, right? Now there's honor within that family name. You know what the problem is? She never told anybody what her family was. Never told anybody that Mordecai was, was her father. Never said that she was part of the exile. Never said anything about that stuff. It was just like this random orphan girl that came into his life. Did that make sense? And now, here's the next part. Mordecai is sitting outside and he hears two of the eunuchs of, of, of the king start talking out by the king's gate, saying how they don't like uh, Xerxes. He's overstepping his rule. He's overstepping his power. And therefore, they are going to kill him. And in this word, they're going to lay hands on him. Okay? Um, the ministry of laying hands. That's what we're, yeah? Um, 
They're going to lay hands on him, right? And, and so Mordecai hears this and he calls for Esther because he can't get involved with the, with the king. So he calls for Esther to come and Esther's like, what's up? And he goes, there's a plot to kill the king. I need you to go and I need you to talk to the king. And so he she like, obviously is like, heck yeah, I will totally do this. She goes to the king and then she's like, hey, I think somebody's trying to kill you. And it's these two guys. And he's like, no way. So they go and they investigate. Yeah. They go and they investigate, and it turns out to be true. And she said, and the king goes, <laughs> excuse me, the king said, who did this? How did you find this? He goes, oh, it was this guy, Mordecai. This guy. Oh. Right? Mordecai. Why? Because she is, she's following what Mordecai said. Don't tell anybody. So he followed Mordecai. They bring Mordecai in. He goes, is this true? And he goes, yeah, this is it. Well, and he writes it down in front of Mordecai, the accounts of what took place, Mordecai's name, and everything. Writes it down into the accounts of the chronicles. They call it the chronicles. Therefore, they have it forever written down in their chronicles in Persia that Mordecai helped save the life of the king. Because Esther is now in the palace and he has a direct connection. Why am I telling you this before Thanksgiving? How does this connect to the pilgrims? Oh, very simple. If you look at the story, nothing went right for Esther and, his, and her family. They were living life great. Think about Mordecai living. If he was part of the palace in Judah, that he had a good life. His family had a good life. And then all of a sudden the Babylonians decide, we're going to come in. We're going to take your land. We're going to crush you because we're bigger than you. And all of a sudden, everything in their life gets flipped upside down. This is not going according to plan. But they always believed that God had a way for them. They never gave up hope that said that this is dire straight. We're just done. Mordecai kept fighting. Did that make sense? Esther, think about her. Well, before Esther, Myrtle. Think about Myrtle. I lost my parents. I'm no longer living where I used to live. And let's just be real. If she's pretty, as, as pretty as she says, uh, as the scripture says that she is, she's probably getting looked at and mocked at by men constantly. And now she doesn't have somebody to take care of her. And now the person that is taking care of her is like, there's no wife. Does that make sense? So it's just Mordecai and Myrtle on their own against the world. But they believe God had a plan. And then all of a sudden, great, now I get to be a sex slave. Do you see the dire straits that they're in? But constantly Mordecai keeps saying, no, this has got to be of God. God has to have a plan for us. We just have to see it through. There has to be a plan for us. We just have to see it through. And that is the problem, I think, in our society, in our lives, and with us. We never get to see the follow-through because we stop before God can do the miracle. Does that make sense? You're like, well, Craig, I don't believe that. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, I'll just bring them into play. Did you know it actually says that the guys that were supposed to throw them into the fiery furnace died before they got thrown in? So how did they get into the fiery furnace? They tripped? <laughs> no, they knew the fulfillment of the plan was for them to be burned in a furnace. I believe they're standing at the top of the furnace. This is a Craig Hamilton theology because I, honestly this is what I see. It says they were killed before going up. So they're standing at the top. They're looking down at Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, with the Babylonian guy, so it's all connected. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's looking up at them going, did our guys just die? And not only did their guys, their strongest guys died because of the heat was so intense. And they're like, well, what do we do now? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. Well, we're supposed to go in, so let's just go in. Why? Because see, we get to a place where we see God show up, and we think, oh, good, God saved me. I'm out of here. What happens if Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego walk back down? Nebuchadnezzar would have grabbed them and got more guys and threw them in again. Does this make sense? Why? The fulfillment was them getting tossed in. Why? Because it's the only time that he could have seen the miracle. The miracle would have only happened if they were in the fire, not at the top of the fire, not near the fire. It only happened when they were in the fire that God shows up and dances with them and celebrates with them. And then they get walked out and the Nebuchadnezzar goes, who in the world are you guys? Who is your God? And they made a decree 
that no one was allowed to make fun of their God. And if they did, they'd be quartered, which means everything tied to a horse and sent in different directions. That was a law, y'all. No, okay. So, <laughs> you weren't allowed to make fun of their God. Why? Today in our society, we don't have that. People make fun of us all the time. Why? Because we never see the fulfillment of what we're supposed to do because they think we stop right before it happens. Why? Because I don't think we have the mindset that the pilgrims have. We don't have the mindset that Mordecai and Esther had that said, we got to see this through no matter what it looks like. Does this make sense? Because the, the miracle only shows up is if you get to where God wants you to be. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. And I, and, and I don't know your families. But I know that family gatherings are hard. But sometimes that's exactly where you need to be because your family members need to see God in you. Does that make sense? Your job, every time you get together with, with family gatherings or even gatherings at all, is supposed to be sharing the light of God everywhere that we go. And if we don't do that, then all we do is we have hidden agendas, hidden motives, and it just destroys the family gathering. We've got to see people for who they are. Like we learned last week, people matter. In this story of Esther and the pilgrims, they really firmly believe people mattered. And you're going to see this, this echo throughout all of Esther. But I wanted you to see this first. This idea that we heard. Now that you know the story, I'm going to go back to the very beginning comments. Did that make sense? So you guys can see it. Can you do that for me? Yeah, Rudy? The very first comment. They maintain an unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant them special privileges, but to impose special responsibilities. Do you see how that fits into Esther? She's not granted privileges because she's the queen. No, she has a responsibility now because God's going to ask her to do things. Does that make sense? Mordecai sees that. Esther sees that. They just have to play it out. The next thing that, we, we, that, they, that was said about the pilgrims, they saw themselves as instruments, not authors of a mysterious master plan. They got to get to this place where they're like, okay, God, I'm where you're at. you got to use me now. Did that make sense? You're going to start seeing that play out. Do you see how the connection is? And the last thing was this. They saw their misfortune as a demonstration of God's provincial uh, power, his guidance. It's his will to be done. Did that, are you guys all with me on this one? This is how Esther starts. And just in case you cared, God is never mentioned. This entire book, God is never mentioned. But it's their heart that shows who their creator is. That's right. That was like right on cue. Their actions proved what they believed. And I ask that to you today. Do your actions pr prove what you, what you believe? Are you in this place where you're just like, God, I know bad things happen, but I know that you have a role. You have something going on, and I will be your instrument in it all. Do you have that? And if you don't, it's okay. You can still get it. It just takes a little while to get there. But how do you do it? You surround yourself with people like this that do get it. And they encourage you. Keep going. Don't give up. Do you know what I mean? And so this is what I wanted to share with you guys before we head into Thanksgiving and before we head into our Christmas um, part of the Esther. So we're going to be following a star. We're going to see salvation come. But at the end of the day, it's where your heart is. Where's your heart? Do you understand that God's at work in all of this? Do you understand that you're an instrument and not an author? Do you understand these concepts? Okay, I think I killed this and put it into the ground. So let me pray. Band, you can come on up. And here's what I'd like you guys to do as we worship at the end. Um, knowing these things that we've talked about, my question then becomes to you as we worship and as we, we start to praise God is this. your misfortunes when you start thinking about this I want you to immediately go back to is God in charge or not especially of your life did that make sense 
So you're going to have all these things that go rushing through your mind. One, you're going to start, what am I thankful for? And then you're going to start being cheesy too. You're going to be cliche. I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful for my car. Because you're going to go through the motions, right? And you might be thankful for those things. But don't go through the motions. I want you to, do, are you really thankful? Do you realize how privileged you are? <laughs> privileged. <laughs> to have food. To have a car. Our, I mean, we say we're thankful, but do we get it? Anyways, what are you thankful for? Last thing is, if you find yourself just going through misfortunes, ask yourself the question, is God still in charge? Amen? So, Father, love on your sons and daughters. May they have a blessed Thanksgiving, Father God. And God, during this time right now, I would just ask, Lord, that you would just show up in our hearts and in our minds. Give us visions, Father God, of the things that we, are, that we need to be thankful for. And God, with all of us, let us know that you're still in charge. And let us have a hope and an inspiration rise from, these, from this worship, Father God. And let us leave here excited to want to be around people. Your sons, your daughter. Let us get excited, Father God, to do your will and your work, no matter what the cost. We love you, Father, in your name.